everybody, my name is Zella Friends, and welcome back to yet another reaction video. Today we're checking out another SCP. This is SCP-001 Yellow. Now, if you're wondering why I'm reacting to another SCP-001 video, is because there are dozens of different variations of SCP-001, including that these are different uh, variations of the way these guys go. And funnily enough, the time I'm recording this, SCP-001 Orange just went live. So, <laughs> talk about me... SCP is in such a short time frame, and then here's another SCP-001. So I have no idea where this is going to go, because the first one I have ab absolutely zero idea. It just seems like it's a code phrase for how things are going, or how these uh, apocalyptic events are supposed to go. But I don't think this one will be an apocalyptic event, just based on the thumbnail. But I could always be proven wrong, considering this is the SCPs, and we have no idea what they're truly going to be until we study them. So with that being said, we're going to go ahead and get right into this in three, two, one, shipping. From far away in orbits around the Earth. Okay, never mind. It is dead. <laughs> almost looked beautiful. I was wrong. White, white pinpricks dotting the planet's surface glinted up at the escaping jet. For generations, much of humanity had lived in fear that the destruction of the world would come from countries launching nuclear weapons at each other. True. No Still is. Come when they started launching them Turn up against again. themselves. The invasion of the weasels had been as savage as it was swift. Much of the human population had been wiped out before any military. Oh, this is a continuation of that. In any significant fashion. No one was sure if the launching of the nuclear weapons was intentional or accidental. But as soon as one country... Okay, I, I literally did not expect this to be a continuation. I thought it was to be something else entirely. My the bad. Quickly followed suit. So we're going to find out what happened first, with the rest of the space shuttle. Think the sponsor of today's video, War Thunder. Are you Skip. looking... Skip. Anyway. <laughs> Earth's rich and powerful, the 1% of the 1%, stared in silence as their home was ripped apart. The high-altitude jet carrying them steadily descended back down to Earth in the direction of the Antarctic. 500 people in total chosen as the successors of the human race, shuffled off the jet and through the frozen outpost. An alarm blared, wrenching all of them out of their shell-shocked silence. A second later, the station shook violently. They had been found. There was no time left. They needed to leave right now. The swarm of I really didn't expect this to be a continuation. Throwing one another out of the way in a desperate attempt to save their own lives, to save the lives of the human race. In front of them, the portal stood open. The green pastures, beautiful trees. Where all felt are they so going, Eden? As the earth behind them was engulfed in war, all those countless beautiful spaces were torn apart and left to waste. But they couldn't think about it now. They had to make it through. The handful of the survivors of the human race ran through the open portal just as an explosion ripped apart the remaining outpost. SCP-001-Yellow refers to a base of operation used for a Foundation Continuance Protocol, specifically Project Yellow. In the event okay. of a world-destroying catastrophe where humanity appears irrevocably doomed, there is one bastion of hope. Referred to as the Garden of Eden by some of the crew, ah, it is the Garden Yellow of Eden. contains a large circular central space, complete with lush green grass and an orchard measuring 500 by 500 meters. This open space constitutes the main living area of Project Yellow. Surrounding this space are tall, sheer cliffs, too vertical to be climbed unaided. Built into these cliffs are 500 sleeper chambers in which those evacuated from planet Earth will be suspended in cryosleep until a time when Earth is fit to be repopulated or a new home has been discovered. How can the Foundation okay. guarantee that this safe haven avoids the calamities that could befall planet Earth? By housing Project Yellow in a separate dimension, a pocket dimension to be specific. Following the successes of Project Bifrost, in which SCP-2591-Omega's ability to access fictional pocket dimensions was utilized, the Foundation was able to establish to a check out that is stable me. and reliable dimension for Yellow to occupy. The only way to access the base of operations was via a dimensional rift or portal housed deep in the Antarctic. Now, of course, if Yellow's population consisted of 500 people in cryosleep, cut off from planet Earth, there would be no one capable of conducting maintenance or assessing the possibility of returning to planet Earth. Therefore, carved into the cliffs alongside the sleeper cells were living quarters for the crew of 60 specialists. 
It was this workforce who sat down together on the night of the apocalypse and raised a toast in a more bittersweet celebration. All 500 of the evacuees had managed to make it safely through the portal before its collapse. Each of them had been welcomed to Project Yellow and shown to their individual sleeper pods before being entered into cryosleep for the foreseeable future. But as each of the crew members raised their glasses into the air, Dr. Katrina Keyes couldn't help but feel uneasy about the proceedings. Working in this job, you'd have to have a dark sense of humor and an ability yeah. to move past things that could destroy the mental well-being of your average person. Even then, she struggled to come to terms with the near destruction of the human race. For her and the rest of the crew, life would look nothing like it did before they arrived here. It was vital for the integrity of the project that the crew remained consistent and effective in their work indefinitely. As a result, Yellow had been set up with perpetuity in mind. Every 55 years, she and all of her crewmates would pass on their knowledge, memories, and entire sense of being into a genetic clone. They would then die, allowing their clone to take oh. over the responsibility of those tasks. In another 55 years, this would repeat again and again and again. All this time, it is the crew... It remind, that literally just reminded me of a Team Fortress 2 SFM video I watched a little while ago called Home. It kind of like goes the same way with the fem scout in space and she she ends up dying at the end, but in the process manages to find a way to clone herself and pass on her knowledge so that one can continue the research. That's kind of what that just reminded me of. And that video didn't even come out that long ago. Crew's responsibility to monitor the status of Earth through the use of 100 drones. Once the Earth is deemed safe, all 500 sleepers may be awoken and briefed on the current situation. If all 500 unanimously vote that returning to Earth is safe, they will do so. Otherwise, they will return to cryosleep, and the process will continue. It was little wonder that Dr. Keyes was unable to raise a glass with her colleagues at the prospect of being stuck here, cloned indefinitely for generations. She sat in silence as they raised their glasses and then emptied them. A couple of them coughed and sputtered. Their drinks must have gone down the wrong way, but then more coughs filled the room along with choking sounds. Whoa. Much to Dr. Keyes' horror, within less than a minute, she found herself alone, surrounded by the 59 corpses of her crewmates. Were they poisoned? Also, the remember what I was actually originally going to say about a minute ago? Uh, it kind of explains what the thumbnail was. Cloning. That explains it. But yeah, I think all these guys were just poisoned. In order for Project Yellow to be viable indefinitely, it was paramount that they find a solution for natural wear and tear. Through generation after generation of usage, essential items such as tools, computer systems, and even articles of clothing would eventually wear away and fall into disrepair. As such, Project Yellow was set up as a selective entropy zone in which inorganic matter would not degrade over time. Achieving such a zone was naturally an incredibly difficult undertaking. Project Bifrost underwent countless iterations as the team strived to create a stable and balanced fictional pocket dimension capable of sustaining human life long term. Over the next few days after the death of her crewmates, Dr. Katrina Keyes read through as much as she could about Project Bifrost. But why did they die? In notes, she found records of dimensions where lava rained from the sky and the grass was radioactive. Yellow had been the first dimension without any glaringly obvious hazards for human life. But naturally, their work had quirks. One key quirk was that the chemical composition of cyanide and their drinks had been switched with one another. The only crew member not to raise a toast had been the only crew member not to drink a glass full of poison. Months went ah. by, leaving Dr. Keyes alone to assess her situation. The drones, strategically positioned all around Earth to monitor its safety levels, had been systematically destroyed by the weasels. Only one feed remained, a security camera on the other side of the portal and the Antarctic outpost. There was virtually no intel to go off of, no way of knowing what the status of planet Earth was aside from the fact that this one burnt out shell of a room still existed. Some days, Keys would stare at the screen for hours, forgetting to go to bed. On others, she would walk through the orchard, trying her best to pretend that nothing outside of this 500 by 500 meter space existed, in a way, it didn't. The Orchard of Yellow did not consist of your usual apple trees. Instead, nope. suspended from branches were essential supplies that the crew would need while manning and maintaining this base of operations. 
Some trees grew antibiotic drugs, others long strands of linen capable of being fashioned into clothing. Dr. Keyes' favorite tree was the one that grew rolls of toilet paper and tubes of toothpaste. It almost reminded her of a Halloween prank. Dr. Keyes' <laughs> mental state steadily deteriorated as year after year she walked through the same orchard alone. Never before in history had one human being had so much control over the fate of the human race. At any moment, Dr. Keyes could have inputted a few simple commands into the computers and killed off all 500 of the remaining human beings in existence. The decision not to, to hold on to hope that one day humanity will be able to start again, was the only thing that kept her going day after day. in there. <laughs> only that and the other thing. The prospect of having to prepare for her clone to take over. While constructing the cloning pods, the crew had made a number of small errors. The most glaring of which was that the fact that while all of the genetic material would be transferred from one person to their clone offspring, the mind would not. In other words, the clone that would replace her in this facility in 55 years' time would be starting out from scratch as a regular newborn baby. No memories, no advanced cognition. So mm -hmm. Dr. Keyes went about preparing for the next of kin. She herself would die in the cloning process meaning that she would need to come up with a way of raising a child to be capable of running the whole facility from beyond the grave. Item 1 on her to-do list, create a god that her offspring would forever be in service to. With a sardonic smile, Ow. Dr. Keyes came up with an appropriately amusing name, Tracy the Sparkling. Seventy years later, Yellow was still operated by just a single crewmate, only now this crewmate was a 15-year-old girl. Nicknaming herself KK2, she went about all of her daily tasks with infectious excitement. The idea that she alone was responsible for the fate of the human race could not make her happier, and she was determined not to screw it up, both for her sake and to not anger her god, Tracy the Sparkling, whom she worshipped every evening before bed. Whenever a problem would come up, she would go and visit KK1, where she knew she would be met with sound advice. Pushing open the door to the crew quarters, KK2 would find the corpse lying on the floor in its usual place as a number of pre-recorded messages would bark Oof. at her. Lesson NE95. Question, how come the how come after the host is well actually rather, why does the host die when the clone is complete? Like why does that happen? Seven. Why taking a bath is important, even if no one but you will ever know how you smell. All she had to do was not anger the disciplinary drones with their harsh tasers and do her duty until it was time for KK-3 to take over. At that point, she would be welcomed into the afterlife with all of the other KKs, a wonderful and magical place known simply as Burger King. That was until KK-2 <laughs> got far enough through the audio recordings of her predecessor to discover that Tracy the Sparkling was entirely made up and her life meant nothing. It was just a stepping stone for another clone, for another clone, for another clone, until eventually the Earth would be okay. By KK-52, the remaining camera on Earth, the one housed in the Antarctic outpost, went offline. While inorganic material within yellow compound would not undergo aging, the same could not be said of the circuitry left on Earth. Generation after generation of KK lived and died, each one growing more spiteful towards the one that came before them. Each one did their best to undermine the one that would come after them. The lore around Tracy the Sparkling expanded further and further with each generation. There would be waves of highly religious KKs, followed by waves of devoutly atheistic ones, as each sought to rebel against their pseudo-parents. KK-89 was the first huh. to expand the religious movement to include the Teaspoons. Very methodically, she went through each teaspoon in the canteen and named it after a different animal from Earth. Before long, subsequent KKs established a shrine to the teaspoons. The living space of Project Yellow steadily descended into madness. Yeah. With writings all over the walls, bizarre decorations, and rituals long forgotten until a new KK came along and invented something to take their place. KK216 lived her entire life in silence, never once recording an audio log or even talking to herself. She lived and died walking through the garden in silence, wrapped up in linens. KK310 did the opposite. She fancied herself a music composer and scrawled the lyrics to haunting symphonies about nuclear apocalypse, eternal isolation, and the prospect of the angel of death coming to rescue her across all of the walls. No matter how hard any of the KKs tried, however, none of them were able to hack into the cloning machine. Generation after generation of Dr. Keys lived and died, 
desperate to know what a friend was, to have someone else to talk mm. to, but despite all of their best efforts. In the end, they all kept going crazy, which is understandable because they live in isolation from one another and can't live together, which is sad, to say the least. They were unable to tamper with the cloning machine to get it to spit out another person. For several hundred years, the yeah. KKs gave up entirely. That was until KK-507 came along. Day after day, she sat at the cloning machine, desperately typing away at it, trying her best to figure out how the computer coding worked. The downside of living in a pocket universe was that none of the computer circuitry behaved the way it would on Earth. She was certain that she'd made progress. Any generation now, they were going to have a breakthrough and be able to make a friend, when all of a sudden, a totally alien noise filled the containment space, a sound that hadn't been heard for millennia. Alert. Door controls overridden. Opening. KK-507 Opening. turned around in horror to see that the portal, the entrance to their world from Earth, had been opened. The figure of a man. No, not a man. A robot, painted to almost look like a, a crash test dummy, a crash dummy. out into the orchard. Hello. The goddess has informed us that this is the last bastion of the true human race. Is that correct? KK-507 opened her mouth and screamed. Thanks again to the sponsor of today's oh video, War Thunder. Don't forget to click the link in the description. Okay, so it seems like another human race is coming to save what's left of humanity because there are multiple... There is a, the SCP multiverse, so other SCP foundations exist. And sometimes in those universes, when they collapse and fail, the survivors integrate themselves into another universe, which seems to be a regular basis for these guys, I guess. So I guess the another SCP Foundation from another universe is sending in these guys to try and interact and see what's going on and kind of get up to date. Because the way it seems like they may have gotten to, the, to their universe, seeing the weasels, taking them out, learned about the plans that the original humanity had done, and went to go see if they can talk to them, which kind of seems like where this is going. But if none other of these videos exist, in fact, when did this one come out? Six months ago. So I'll have to take a look around and see if I could find any more of the SCP-01s under this category and everything else. So I'll take a look and see if I can find any more of this, because I did not expect this to be a continuation. I thought this would be a separate story, like SCP-001, because there's so many of them. Um, but other than that, I'll look, see if I can find them, and in the meantime, I'll just keep reacting to other SCPs until I find them. So with that being said, hopefully you guys enjoyed today's reaction video. Please like and subscribe also, guys, and I'll see you in the next reaction video. Bye!